Good morning. Happy Sunday, Kinport. Wonderful to see you this morning. Let's all stand and enter into God's presence. It's always a joy to worship together with you. So come on, let's just praise him today. Leave everything behind. Let's sing about how he never fails us. Praise you, God. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. We give you glory and praise in this place. I tried so hard to see it. Took 
me so long to believe it, that you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never earn it. You give what we don't deserve it. You take the broken things. Raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants falling, you stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I am who you say I am. Crown me with confidence, I am seated. You're teaching me how to receive it. So let all the striving cease. Why? This is my victory. You are my champion. Giants fall in you stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I Jesus, you've conquered it all. Hallelujah, you've conquered it all. Oh, we praise you, Lord. Come on now, sing this out when I lift my voice. Come on, sing it, church. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the praising him today. This is your opportunity to worship everything. We're everything out in favor of God.
promises are yes and amen. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. your promises my confidence is your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness I will rest in your promises my confidence your faithfulness, faithful who you are, faithful forever you will be, faithful who you are, all your promises are yes and amen. Yes, and amen. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. All your promises are yes and amen. that in this house today all God's promises are yes in our amen all right that's what the amen means the amen is not just a period it's not just an exclamation point it is to say I affirm in what you're doing God I believe in what you're doing God I declare what you're doing God that's what our amen means it means yes God in your will be done all right isn't it great faithful he's faithful God is faithful no matter what no matter what God is faithful when we're not faithful God is faithful when we're faithful, God is faithful. When we turn to God, He's faithful. When we turn away from God, He's faithful. When we love, He's faithful. When we hate, He's faithful. But it's time today to turn to that faithfulness and give gratitude to the Father and give thanks to the Father. And you're here today. I, I just If there's one thing, I want you to know more than anything what God is doing in your life. I want you to walk out of these doors today knowing that God is doing something in you. And whatever you have, whatever energy or strength or faith, whatever you have left, all you need, all you need is just to understand God is faithful. He's going to bring you through whatever you're going through. And so no matter what you have, and we want to pray over that today, we just want to give gratitude and thanks to the Father in heaven. And I want to invite our prayer leaders to come forward to the altar because in this time, we always take this time in this final song that we sing to offer an opportunity for any who need a hand laid upon you or to somebody to pray over you, believe in you. There are people up at the altar right now. And as we sing, you can come up and receive prayer. You can pray right where you are. Jesus is here. Jesus is surrounding each and every one of us. And so let's give our gratitude to the Father in heaven as he provides signs and wonders to our hearts, mind, soul, and to our strength. In Jesus' name. If you've come in here today with a burden, I really want you to focus on what the words of this song say.
going to give him our gratitude no matter what. I'm going to sing this out. All my works fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. Every song must stay. So I lift my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing high.
Jesus. Sing out one more time. Come on, church, just the voices. So I throw up my hands, praise you. You sing. up your hands in this place. Father, we praise you. We give you glory, Lord, that no matter what we have, no matter how much or how little, we come to the throne and we sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah, Lord, for you are the one who was and is and is to come. You are the one who is worthy. You are the one that we turn to. We seek first your kingdom. We seek first your righteousness. And we know that all these things will be added on to us, Lord, as we seek you. Let us seek you in this place. Bless these people today. Bless all that are here today. Bless all that are dedicating their time and strength and energy to you. And let us love you, God, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And let us be here together as one voice and one body saying praise the Lord, saying hallelujah. We sing to you. We declare to you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all praise. We give you all praise. We pray over all that are here today. We glorify you in this place, and we celebrate all that you're doing. So, Father, touch our hearts. Transform us. Let us not conform to this world. Let us be renewed by your Holy Spirit today. Let us feel your tangible presence in this place. May we glorify you, and may every word, thought, choice, and action build your kingdom. We thank you and praise you and all these things together we pray in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Good to see you. Turn to your neighbor. Tell them how good it is to see them at church today before you find your seat.
right, everybody, if you want to find your seat, we'll continue on our service today. Give everybody a high five and head to your seats now. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Well, it's great to see everybody here today. I don't know about you, today was the very first morning that I had where I had an opportunity to sit outside and just enjoy some coffee and, you know, just read my Bible, go through my devotionals. So I love, so we're praying that the April showers are over, right? I mean, we're only halfway through April, but we're, we're just declaring the April showers are over. All right, so let's believe for that. Let's pray for that. We need to pray together, by the way, okay? I think if we all join our prayers and, and say enough, let's, let's hold off for a few weeks. I, I think something will happen. So if I haven't had a chance to meet you, let me just introduce myself. My name's Thomas. I'm the lead pastor here at Kimport Assembly, and we're, just, we're thrilled you're joining us today on a wonderful Sunday. If you're new here, or if it's your, if it's your first time, you've been coming only for a few weeks, uh, we'd love to get to know you more. So we have this U card. We're here for you. We're here to serve you. We're here to bless you, whatever we can do for you. That's why we're here. So please fill out this U card, turn it in on our welcome desk. If you're new, we'd love to give you a gift just to bless you and say thank you so much for joining our service and checking us out and uh, wonderful things happening here today. So with that said, I just want to share a couple of uh, announcements uh, that are happening here in the church. So first off, I just want to let you know that uh, next week... Next Sunday, we have water baptisms, all right? And so we're thrilled. We love, oh, we love the baptism. Yeah, see? We love baptizing. We love baptizing. And not just because you get to dunk somebody under the water, not just because of that, because of what it represents, right? We know. We who have been baptized in water know the declaration that we publicly confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. We're dunked under that water, our sins, everything that we were before, it's washed clean, it's drowned out, and we come to new life as we come up out of that water. It's a powerful moment. We'd love for the, to experience that with you. There is a sign-up sheet on our back table, so you can go and make sure that you sign up to be water baptized. Uh, we, we, we can have as many or as little supplies as you need, even if you need to change of clothes. We'll, we'll provide that for you. So make sure you sign up for water baptisms. All right. Uh, the next thing is this month, uh, we've got something for the men and for the ladies. All right. And so we have two events coming up that are going to uh, empower our men, our kingdom men, and then our Kinport women. So uh, kingdom men next Saturday, the 20th, we're going to have our our monthly breakfast and Bible study. So this is a potluck. We, all, we always bring something and we have a great time. Uh, any gentlemen in the room that have yet to join us, it's a great time. We have a lot of fun. We do a Bible study. We pray together. It's so important that iron sharpens iron, especially our men. We want to make sure that we have men that are honorable and representing the kingdom of God here in our community. So Kingdom Men on Saturday. And then the following Saturday, we have uh, afternoon tea with Kimport women. So there's a lot, of, a lot of ladies very interested in this. So that's happening. That's an afternoon tea at 1 p.m. All right, so next Saturday, Kingdom Men at 9. The Saturday after, Kimport women at 1. All right, so we just we love reaching every generation. We love reaching our men, our women. It's going to be a great time. So that's happening. Water baptisms are happening. And then also, if uh, last thing I want to say, if you are an usher, so if you help in some way with our church and ushering and giving or up at the altar, uh, we would like to have a meeting with you next week after church. So just stick around. If you're interested in joining the team, stick around. But we're going to have that, and, and we want to equip you to uh, to become the best you can possibly be and see Jesus move in powerful ways. All right. So, before we get into our uh, before we get into our message, I want to have our offering. So, I'd like to ask our ushers if you would please come forward and prepare for the giving moment. Uh, of course, every time we give, I like to emphasize Second Corinthians chapter nine. Don't don't give regretfully. Don't give forcefully. Don't give under compulsion. Give based on what the Lord would have you give. Partner with Him. And understand that there is an incredible blessing when we give of ourselves to our Lord, when we give our time, our energy, also with our finances. And so we thank you so much for your generous giving. Multiple ways you can give, not just here in the service, but also online. There's even a cell number you can text. 
to give today. And when you give, there are a couple of different options as to where you're giving. One is your tithes and offerings. That's everything that comes into the church, stays in the church. And then difference makers, which is local outreach, global missions, and future expansion. So that's everything that is outside the church. And we're thankful for each and every one of you for giving. Uh, we've been talking to some people that are going on mission. We have our Africa trip coming up. We've got a Nicaragua trip coming up. We've got a lot of wonderful things happening around the world. We've also got some great things in our community. So it's all supported through your giving. And we just thank you so very much. So let's go ahead and pray over our offering today. And we thank you. <laughs> Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you for the responsibility to give. Thank you, Lord, that you bless us. Thank you, Lord, that you can multiply all that we have, especially when we trust you with it instead of holding on to it. So, Father, let us let go today. Let us let go of every reservation. Let us let go of every hesitation. And bless us today as we give of ourselves. And we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you that it's not really giving. It's, it's more like returning to you, Father. It's returning to you what you've already blessed us with. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for everything that comes into this church and empowers our ministries to do the work of your will. We thank you, Lord, for the Difference Makers giving that supports missionaries around the world and some of these missions projects we have coming up. So, Father, we praise you and we pray to you that you would help us and empower us to be generous givers, to not give under compulsion. We thank you, Lord, that it's not about the amount, it's about what's in our heart and how we've partnered with you. We pray over this time, we thank you, and we pray blessings upon this moment in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, as the containers pass, turn your attention to the screens as we go into the message for this morning. And uh, called Limitless Mindset. So we are here and we're learning and growing. Of course, we understand that there are limits. We have limits. We have a limit to our strength, our energy. We have a limit to our time. I, I know I've prayed multiple times. Uh, if you're a leader of one of our ministries, I most likely have said to you, is there any way you can add uh, a day or two onto my schedule? Because it would just, it would help immensely. But we know there are worldly limits, and that's just how things have been created. But we also, have, we also have things that are going on in the spiritual realm. We have things that are happening within us, within our hearts and our minds, where sometimes we do hit those limits, but we don't have to. We can actually develop a limitless mindset of a number of different things in our life. And that's what we want to empower you with over these next several weeks, is to understand how we can build limitless Fill in the blank. Last week, we started with faith, probably one of the bigger ones, because sometimes our faith wavers. Sometimes our faith, things just aren't going well enough. Something happens, something just out of the blue, something we didn't even see coming, and then all of a sudden, we're, we're rocked, and our faith is shaken, and we don't understand, what happened, God? God, why have you, why have you forsaken me? I don't, I don't feel you here. And so we talked about faith. One of the most prominent things, i, I, I got to tell you, you know, sometimes I'm preaching to you, but I preach to myself oftentimes too. And the one thing that, that I hold on to that we talked about last week the most is the idea that our faith and our emotions are not interconnected. Sometimes we think that way. Sometimes we think that our, our emotions, it, they, they fuel our faith. And that's what takes place is that because our emotions are in a negative place, because we're upset or frustrated or angry or, or rage-filled, that all of a sudden our faith is limited because of it. But faith isn't supposed to work based off our emotions. It works based off of God himself, off his power, because his power is limitless, right? And so we talk about limitless faith. You can all have, we can have limitless faith. All right, so today we're going to talk about the next 
the next aspect of our mindset that could become limitless. Uh, before I do that, let me ask a question. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to be completely transparent, all right? Completely transparent, and I just want to ask you one very simple question. Who here today, right now, is happy? Who's happy? Happy. Lots of, all right, lots of happy people. All right, that's awesome. Praise the Lord. Everybody's happy. All right, now, I don't know, I don't know if you're comfortable with this, but is anybody willing to admit that they are not very happy? We've, we've got some trying to raise others' hand, so I don't know if that's an intercession we have to do or something like that. Okay, but a couple of hands. I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate it. Okay, so happiness, we all want to be happy, right? I mean, I don't think any of us want to live our day. I don't think any of us want to spend our day miserable. I, I, I mean, does anybody like, do you, do you know anybody like that? Like, like they're just, they're, they're thrilled with the idea of being miserable all day? Is that a thing? I don't know. It, it, okay, I'm hearing some, okay, apparently it is. All right, well, I don't think we're supposed to be like that. I think we're supposed to want to find happiness. But happiness, joy, let's, let's call it joy, is limited. Joy is limited based off of what I have in my life. Joy is based off of uh, what, what, what is surrounding me, how I'm feeling, how I'm thinking, the people in my life, the things that are going on, right? When things are going on and it's a really good thing, I'm happy. When things are going on and it's really crappy, I'm not happy. And so we want to talk about this idea of joy. You know, I did some research uh, as I was preparing this message and I found out, do you know the number one the number one place in the world that is the happiest. It's not Cherry Tree, but that's, a, that's good. According to these statistics, the, the website could be totally off. Let's, let's just say that. Let's, yeah, let's say I, li I like that. I like that attitude. All right, so the most happiest place in the entire world, according to statistics that I've pulled, is Finland. It's Finland. Finland is the happiest place. Do you know where the United States ranks? Not quite that low. 23. So the United States is the 23rd happiest place. So there are 22 places around this world that are happier than we are. And I was curious about this. I'm like, why? So, okay, Finland is the happiest place on earth. Let, all right, let's, let's plant the church. Let's, let's make the Finland, Kimport, Finland campus, all right? And we'll all go there and be happy. And everybody who likes to be miserable can stay here. No, anyway. Um, so uh, I, I was curious, like, why? Why is Finland so happy? So uh, I have an a excerpt from the article here. And it says this, Finnish happiness boils down to the simple things in life. Connecting with nature. Caring for one's mind and body. Appreciating design and art around us. Happiness can be found in moments of pure contentment you get when the setting is just right. On a bike ride in a forest with a perfect playlist. Or enjoying a, a post-sauna sausage. That, I don't know, that sounds kind of interesting. I'm like, I, I'd like to enjoy a post-sauna sausage. Like, that's just, that, I didn't know that was a thing. While cooling off a beautiful summer evening. So this is stated by the Senior Director of International Marketing uh, at Business Finland. All right, so that is an excerpt from what he said. But you know what is very interesting about this is certain things that I don't see in this list. I don't see anything about money in, in this list. Uh, pure contentment, settings just right, bike ride in the forest, nature, caring for one's mind and body, appreciating the design and arts. Uh, I mean, I guess the post sauna sausage costs money, but I don't see anything about I don't see anything about riches. I don't see anything about fame and glory. I don't see any of that in this list. And you think about you think about the United States twenty third. What do we do? We're in the pursuit of happiness, which is the American dream, which is own everything we want and have everything we want, and we we attribute that. But that's not what this list says. Now, even the article states it says. These results are based entirely on self-reported perceptions of satisfaction. Okay, these are, so it, it, it's all up in the air as to, you know, it's these people, but we, we understand that this survey was done with the self-perceptions of most likely hundreds of thousands of people. And they ranked, what does joy really look like? And apparently the most joyful place on earth is Finland. Of course, we know the most joyful place in entirety is the kingdom of God. 
Okay, and so, but sometimes we, we lose sight of what truly gives us joy in the world. What truly can you give us joy when we find none? And so today we want to talk about that limitless mindset of finding limitless joy. So to do this, we're going to, uh, by the way, apparently there is an international day of happiness and we missed it. It was in March. So I guess I wasn't very happy that day. I don't know. Anyway, so we are going to go today into the Gospel of John. We're going to be in John chapter 16. Feel free, if you have a Bible, turn to John chapter 16. If you don't, we have these scriptures on the screen today. And we're going to be reading. Uh, we're going to be reading what Jesus says to his disciples. John chapter 16 is very much, it's almost like Jesus is, is preaching. It's a lot, not, not a lot of narrative. It's just a lot of Jesus speaking to his disciples. This is coming before the cross, before his resurrection. And in this section, he's starting to speak about the council counselor that will come, the advocate. Uh, he talks about the fact that he needs to go. He needs to go and die on the cross, raise from the grave, and then ascend into heaven. It's necessary so that we can have a certain helper and counselor in our life, this being the Holy Spirit. Okay, and so now let's read John chapter 16, starting in verse 13, and if you would all stand with me as we give reverence to God's word. John chapter 16, starting in verse 13. He says this, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will no longer see me. And again, in a little while, and you will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying to us, a little while, and you will no longer see me? And again, in a little while, you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, they said, what, what does he mean by this, a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Verse 19, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Are you discussing amongst yourselves what I meant when I said, A little while, and you will no longer see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born... She no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. On that day, you will ask nothing of me. Very truly, I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for this scripture. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the apostle John who, uh, exiled on the island of Patmos, felt inspired and empowered to write this gospel story, his letters, and also revelation. Lord, Father, we thank you for all that you're doing in your word and how it can touch our hearts and transform our minds today. So help us, Lord, empower us. We dedicate this time to you. We dedicate this message to you. Let this be spoken from nothing more than your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, give us all truth this morning. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God some praise and then have a seat. So we see here that now Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, saying, listen, I'm about to leave you. And they didn't get it, right? There was, sometimes you, you find a significant lack of joy because you're just so darn confused. Like, what on earth is happening here? What does Jesus mean? He's going away and he's coming back. When are you going away? Where are you going? Are you going to send us a postcard? Are you going to bring us back a gift? Technically, he did bring us back a gift if you really think about it. All right, hallelujah to that. But... This idea comes that, you know, sometimes Jesus is trying to teach us, Jesus is trying to encourage us, and we just don't get it. We don't understand. But Jesus here, and, and you know, when I was, when I was creating this message, 
uh, one incredible treasure when it comes to rejoicing is the letter that Paul writes to the Philippians. I, I would just encourage you as some homework. Paul is imprisoned at the time of writing the letter to the Philippians, and he writes the word joy or rejoice over a dozen times in that letter. But I felt today, I didn't want to go there. I wanted to stay here. I wanted to stay with what Jesus himself said and how Jesus connected joy with himself and with the Holy Spirit because that's what really matters. All right, so let's break this down. Like I said, John wrote this. Uh, John was one of the 12 disciples. Jesus is really preaching to them in this moment, and then he starts to talk about the spirit of truth, the fact that it's necessary for him to go so that the Holy Spirit can come and live within us. Then Jesus starts to talk about his death on the cross and his resurrection. He's going for a little while, then he's coming back. They don't understand, and so they're confused they're exhausted, they're tired, right? There's a lot that's about to happen. And he's even saying, listen, the world's going to rejoice this. The, world's, the world is rejoicing a lot today. But he then said, you will have pain, you will weep and mourn, but your pain will turn into joy. Your pain will turn into joy. I don't know if you, I, I mean, I believe that. I don't know if you believe it. I got really quiet in here. Like, you understand that pain can turn into joy, right? You understand that that's what the Holy Spirit can do. The Holy Spirit can turn pain into joy. The Holy Spirit turns the mess into the message. The Holy Spirit turns the test into the testimony. I love all these catchy phrases. They're so true, though, because the Holy Spirit makes all things possible. All right, come on, lots of moms in here. Jesus actually says, Jesus refers to a woman who's in pain through childbearing. And giving birth to a child. All right, gentlemen, can we just be humble for a moment? We got no, I, I know most of our hands still are a little sore from the time that those wives crushed it, but let's, let's be honest, we don't quite understand all the pain that they went through. But I've seen it now four times. So I have four children. And I've seen it four times. I've seen that moment. I've seen that moment of pain. I've seen that moment where it's just like, there's just agony and tears and heartache and, and just complete lack of anything joyful or satisfactory. And then you hear the cries. And then the nurses place the newborn upon the chest of the mother. And it just disappears. Because you see that life. You see that birth. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And what Jesus is saying is you have to look past the pain. Jesus wants, to, Jesus wants to encourage you with the fact that there is incredible joy birthed through any pain we face in this world. Through anything we go through, anything we face, Jesus is there and the Holy Spirit is there. The Holy Spirit is ready to be our counselor. The Holy Spirit, Jesus is, at, is telling us, ask. Ask the Father. You'll receive. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. How many of us, we, we, we allow ourselves to, to lose our joy, to lose our focus. We lose our focus on God himself, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's so strange. It, it, it seems like, it's almost like it's an equation. It's almost like it, it means something, the fact that when we, when we suffer and lose joy, and, and then because of that, we disconnect from God, and, and we don't pray as much, or we don't seek him enough, and then that, that lack of joy just kind of ignites into, into a crazy void. And yet, when we feel like we're losing joy and we then put more into God, more prayer, more worship, and we find that that void is being filled, it's, it's strange how it works. And it's honestly, sometimes, I don't, maybe you know somebody like this, but oftentimes what happens is people who are connected and people who have a support system, a life-giving support system, and they have a life-giving church that they come to, and they've got people that they can depend on. See, they interconnect, and when things are going wrong, they connect more. When things are going wrong, they engage more, and they pray more, and they worship more. And I see it. I see that they grow, and they, and they adapt, and there's grace, and there's mercy, and there's release and relief. But I also see the other side. I see people, and it's heartbreaking when people, things are going wrong, so they disconnect more. They pull back. They stop. They stop talking. They stop connecting. They worship less. They pray less. But then 
but then I see and hear them talk a lot more about their problems because they're allowing the joy that they have to be fueled by what's going on around the world. And that's not what Jesus teaches us. It's not about, see, when our joy, when our joy is pointed toward everything we have here, when our joy is focused toward people or the things that we acquire or the things that we earn, that joy will end. That joy is limited. So what's limitless joy? What's limitless joy? Well, look at this main point. If you want to take notes, feel free to write this down. My joy is limitless not when it's a result of what I gain, but when I focus on who Jesus is and what the Holy Spirit is doing in my life. That's limitless joy. Has nothing to do with what I gain. Has nothing to do with the fact that I earned a little extra money in my paycheck. Has nothing to do with the fact that I just bought that new car I wanted. Has nothing to do that I just started this new job. Has nothing to do that I just made a new friend. Has nothing to do that, that I just, uh, just got an off day at school. Has nothing to do with any of that. Has nothing to do with the fact that you signed up for your one week vacation around the world on a cruise ship. Has nothing to do with that because that joy ends. That joy can be taken, by the way. That joy can be taken. Friendships can end. Jobs cannot be what they turned out to be. Cruise ships can be canceled. I don't pray any of that. Anybody going on a cruise? I'm not. There's no prophecy there. I'm not a prophet. All right, don't worry about it. Okay. But those, those aspects of joy can be taken. Friendships can be taken. Anything in this world, health, anything can be taken if it's based off the world. But when the joy is a result of who Jesus is, when the joy is a result of what the Holy Spirit's doing, that is a joy that never ends. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He's the advocate. He's the counselor. And so there are no limits when our joy is focused on nothing more than that. That's what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, in just a few weeks here, Pentecost Sunday's coming up, the time when the apostles, the early church, baptized in the Holy Spirit, fire, tongues of fire came down, amazing moment, and it's a moment that shows us that there is a power, there is a person who believes in us and loves us and wants to equip us and live on the inside of us to give us every resource that we need in the spiritual realm to stand above to be in authority, to have the power of Jesus, and to be in all joy and peace, abounding in hope and faith. And that's the Holy Spirit. And that's what he wants for you. That's what he wants. Can we pray? Can we pray to God for that new car? Absolutely. Can we pray to God for that new job? Absolutely. Can we pray to God for another church? Because this one is just, nah. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Okay, we can pray to God for all these things, but, and he will, he will bless us. He wants to provide. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the provider. But what God wants more than anything else is for us to find the joy we have in his son and in his advocate, the Holy Spirit. That's where the joy needs to come from. Notice that connecting, notice how it connects in Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope, he is the God of hope. Why is he the God of hope? Well, because he loved us so much. He sent in his one and only son who died for us, rose from the grave, shows us that when we believe in him, we have an eternal life. So, I mean, it's pretty hopeful to think that this is not the end. When I pass on from this life, I get to live in eternity with Jesus where there's no more pain, no more sickness, no more despair. That's pretty hopeful, isn't it? I mean, five people think it's hopeful. The rest are like, I don't know. Can I just have, can I just have the joy now? Like, <laughs> Can I just have the joy now? I don't know about that eternity stuff. I, 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 I'd like to think it's a long ways away. We got we to gotta focus on it now, church. We got to focus on it now. We've got to stop. We've got to stop depending on our joy 
to be the result of what's happening around us in our relationships or in our, in, in our community or in, in our environment. It's not that. The joy must come from within. The joy must come from Jesus himself. The joy must come from the Holy Spirit. That is the only limitless joy that exists. That is the only limitless joy that exists. So today, let's talk about this. The title of my message, A Wildfire of Joy. We want, we want the joy in your life to be a wildfire. And I understand that, you know, the concept of fire is very destructive, right? But there's also in the Bible where it talks about fire being the cleansing agent, the fire of the Holy Spirit, where John, uh, the, John the Baptist, not the Apostle John, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with wa- water, but he who is coming will baptize you with fire, right? So we want that fire to be a wildfire within your soul. We want it to spread throughout. We want it to start not just here, but we want it to radiate. We want it to radiate to every single soul that's in this place. We want you to take that and spread like a wildfire in cherry tree, the happiest place on earth, according to us, right? We want, we want that wildfire to spread out past cherry tree. We want that wildfire to spread through our live stream. We want the wildfire of joy to spread all throughout our relationships, all throughout our community, all throughout our nation, all throughout the world, so that the only joy that we're depending on and the only joy that is radiating is the joy of Jesus Christ. That's what we want. So can we, can we start and ignite a wildfire of joy today? Can we do that? Thank you. Somebody said, yeah, thank you. It's like, can we start it? Okay, we got more. Y'all, y'all need coffee on this side. Get the coffee. Let's go. Caffeine plus the Holy Spirit equals awesome. A wildfire of joy. That's what I'm believing for. That's what I want to see in your life. So let's talk about four keys to multiply joy in your life. Four keys to multiply joy. And I'm going to tell you, it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with people. Well, you know, scratch that. There's some people in there. We'll talk about it later. It has nothing to do with money, finances, acquisitions, gain, cars, campers, land, houses, swimming pools, saunas with sausages. That's not part of this. Four keys to multiplying joy in my life. Number one, instead of drawing attention to myself, focus my everything on Jesus. Instead of drawing attention to myself, focus my everything on Jesus. What do I mean by this? Well, I think, I think we, all, we all have a desire to, to be a good person. I think we all have a desire to be liked. I think we all have a desire to be accepted. I think we all have a desire to, for, for people around us to, to like us and to, and to understand who we are. I think we all have that, some of us maybe more than others. I know that especially, especially in my high school and college days, I was, I was obsessed with the way people thought about me. I mean, as soon as I, as soon as I heard somebody didn't like me, I'd start to think right there and then, all right, how can I change? What can I do differently? How can I be a completely different person so that more people like me? How can I be liked more? How can I not be rejected? I was in the theater program in college, and so there was always so much anxiety because I was nervous that as I auditioned for these musicals and shows that I'd walk up to that cast list and I'd be rejected. And so I based everything. I was, so it was all about drawing attention to who I am, right? And, and, and understand that when I say drawing attention, I'm not saying, hey, everybody, look up here, look at me. It's, it's up here. It's that up here I want to draw attention that t- to myself being a good person, being accepted, being affirmed, that everything I'm doing is right. And, and can I just tell you, if that's how you live and that's how you think, you're going to burn out. You're going you're to exhaust yourself. And that's not what Jesus wants. That's not what Jesus wants. Jesus, Jesus wants our focus to be on him, our everything. Everything that we are should be focused on Jesus. Everything that we are, everything that we do should not be to draw attention to ourselves. It should be to focus everything on Jesus. Right? I don't want to be up here. You know what? I don't know. I don't know how dynamic of a preacher I am. I don't know how, in, how engaging my messages are when compared to 20 other preachers. I've got no idea. But one thing is, I'm not here just because I get to speak. I'm not here because like, oh, look at me. I get the microphone and I get 50 hours of your time because I'm going to keep you extra. Right? It's not that. It's not what I want. What I want is to focus you on Jesus. I want to connect you to the person of Jesus Christ. That's it. And if there's ever a time where I'm up here and I'm not connecting you to Jesus, pull me down. 
because that's not what I want for you. I want you to understand who Jesus is. I want you to focus everything you are on the person of Jesus Christ. He provides joy. Because you know what? There are some people in this room, there are some people in my family and in my life, there are some people that I talk to and we're really happy and we're getting along really well and there's so much joy and then there's people I talk to and I just make them really mad and they just really don't like me. And I, I mean, I, I, okay, so am I going to lose sleep over the fact that I'm not bringing joy to the, to the world like Santa Claus does? I mean, we can't lose sleep over that. That's not what we're here for. We're here to push Jesus. We're here to prioritize Jesus. We're here to inspire with Jesus. We're here to empower with Jesus. Doesn't it say, seek first God's kingdom? Or look at this in Hebrews chapter 12. What does it say? I love this section of scripture. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter. Some translation says the author. The pioneer, the author, the perfecter of faith, who for the sake of joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't know about you, but it seems like Jesus had a happy ending. But because Jesus had a happy ending, guess who, guess who get to ride the coattails of Jesus? We do, right? Right? We're following Jesus to that resurrection power. And we don't even have to go to the cross. He went to the cross for us. Are you thankful for that? Do you reflect on the fact that you did not have to go to the cross? He did. He did it for you because he loves you so much. So how do we reward him? How, how, do, we, how do we pay him back? We don't. And he doesn't expect it. But we can honor him by pursuing him and making sure that everything we do, every thought, every word, every choice, every action will glorify his kingdom. And it's not easy. And there are times that I may say something or I may make a decision and then I have to reflect back and I'm like, oh man, was I really representing God's kingdom there? No, well, how can I, how can I retract or how can I, how can I pivot? How can I make an adjustment so that God's kingdom is glorified? Because I don't want anybody looking at me. I want everybody to see Jesus. That, that's, that's the sole reason I'm here is so you can see Jesus Christ. So, if you want to have a limitless joy, we have to stop drawing attention to ourselves, right? This is where humility comes in. This is where, this is where that idea that everything that Jesus does through us, and don't get me wrong, I always, I always say, you know, I had somebody in Bible school, and, and they just, they, they, they had this automatic response. You ever, you ever like text or email somebody, and then it just pushes back? an automatic response to you. I had this one person, every time, and she was, she was a singer, she was on the worship team at Bible school, and every time I would compliment her, she would always say, it's not me, it's Jesus. Like, real quick. But see, I understand, and, and sometimes I, I, I do challenge that thought a little bit, because yes, it is Jesus, but Jesus is using you, and you're being obedient to it. Jesus is using you, and you're being obedient and faithful to him. And so don't ever forget that. It's all about our obedience. It's all about our faithfulness. But as we are obedient to the person of Jesus, as we are faithful to the person of Jesus, that joy that we receive becomes limitless. Limitless joy. It's all about looking to Jesus. I mean, I feel like this Hebrews chapter 12, that's, that's really all we need. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter, for the sake of joy. Number two, instead of worrying about what's unfinished, praise God for the completion of his will. Instead of worrying about what is unfinished, praise God for the completion of his will. Oftentimes, we allow our joy, we allow our frustration to happen because, you know what, we, we started something and it's not finished yet. And we don't know why it's not finished. Or, or I, I, thought, I, thought, I thought it was going to happen this way, this certain situation. I thought this was going to happen. But then this happened. Why did this happen and not this? 
Why did this never happen in the first place? Or we work so hard, we become, bless you, we work so hard, we work like Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament in Genesis when they were prophesied to have a child of God and they rushed the miracle because they didn't want to wait long enough. And so sometimes we're forcing ourselves ahead and exhausting ourselves and we're losing that joy because we're not doing it on God's timeline. We're doing it on our own. But what we have to do is is stop the worrying. Stop the worrying. Stop, Stop leaning on all the anxiety and the doubt about what's been unfinished and just praise God for what's complete. Praise God for what's complete in your life. You know, it says in, let me, let me find it here. So we, we talk in, in John chapter 16, and it says that you will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. It says that. All right, so you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. All right, I want to focus on that. That is chapter 16, verse 22 that we read about. It says that nobody will take their joy from them. Now, let's fast forward into the book of Acts, and let's look at the fact that the Apostle John, who wrote this gospel, he is the only apostle of Jesus Christ to die naturally. Every other apostle was martyred, murdered, put to death, crucified, stabbed, hung, decapitated, and yet... They died for Jesus without any hesitation. Why? Because their joy did not come from what the world was offering. Their joy did not come from the amenities that they had or the home. Their joy came from the person of Jesus. And if they could lay down their life for the Savior of the universe, if they could lay down their life, no one would take that joy from him. Jesus made that prophetic statement. No one will take your joy from you. And they were willing, they were willing to be put to death for it. I mean, that's so powerful. And I'd li- I mean, I don't think, the way the world's going, who knows, but I don't think many of us, if any of us will, you know, be put to death for our faith. I'd like to think Jesus will return before that. But the fact is, where is that joy? Where is that joy pointed toward? Is that joy that I have in Jesus ready no matter what? Do I have a joy that can never be taken from me? Look at the reason that the Gospels are written in the first place. Those writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, overjoyed. Matthew, Matthew's Gospel is is so prevalent because his writings were intentionally to draw attention to Jesus as the Messiah of the Old Testament. He's the one, he was writing to the Jewish people, making sure to emphasize the family line of Jesus, the bloodline of Jesus, making sure to emphasize the prophecies. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies. Those are things that he brought to completion. You can't exactly argue things that are brought to completion. So look at your life and look at the way that God has completed things in your life. Look at the things that God has brought to completion and focus on those and praise Him for those instead of worrying about what's not done yet. I've said this before, but this is the idea of like grabbing a blessing jar or a blessing journal. Every time that God says something in your life, make a note of it, write it down, put something in a jar. Whenever you have a bad day, whenever you find that the joy of the world has failed you, you then go and you dump out all those, all those little notes that you wrote or you open up your journal and you read about all the ways that God has come through. You read about all the miracles he's done in your life. And that joy, that that joy, you don't get the joy back of the world, but man, you've got, some, you've got some spiritual joy in you. You've got some amazing, amazing testimonies that show that God is good, that he is good all the time, and that he is there to provide. He is there to be your righteousness. He's there to provide your peace. He is there to give you his power. He is there to make you understand that you overcome death itself and live forevermore in the kingdom of heaven with him. Look at what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. We could just 
period there. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Notice, once again, you can't just take scriptures by a sentence, connect everything together. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks. This is the will of God. And then Paul immediately writes, do not quench the spirit. What does that mean? Well, to me, the way I interpret it is if I don't rejoice always, if I don't pray, if I don't give thanks in all circumstances, then I'm quenching the Holy Spirit in my life. I mean, that's a challenging statement, and I've certainly done it my fair share. I have certainly quenched the Spirit. If that is the case, I have quenched the Spirit at times. Do not despise prophecies. One thing. One thing that's so powerful about prophecies is the way that it encourages and edifies, right? Prophecy is not just uh, fortune-telling. Prophecy is not just, uh, you know, predicting what's going to happen. Prophecy is a way to confirm in you what the Holy Spirit is doing. Prophecies are a way to lift you up. And prophecies, man, I'll tell you, there are times when you give a prophetic word to somebody. If you've ever been on the receiving end of a prophetic word, I've, I've received them on my end. I've given them on my end. And, and there is just that one moment. It's the moment that you first receive it. I'll never forget, there was a, um, I was in a prophetic prayer room and we were praying. At the time, I was in Bible school at the time and I did not feel totally prophetic. Like, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not an office of the prophet by any means, but God uses it and everybody can prophesy. Can I just tell you that? Everybody can prophesy. All right, and so I was in this room, and there's a woman sitting there, and there are three of us praying, and, and, and I just said, and, and I'm very visual, and so I'm like, all right, God, I'm just going to put myself out there. I'm either going to say something really mind-blowing, or I'm going to sound really stupid, but it, you know what? It usually is that way with God. When it comes to God, either it's going to be something really mind-blowing or something really stupid. It depends if it's spiritual or worldly. In this case, it was very spiritual, so I was praying, and I said, I don't, I don't know why, but God was showing me a waterfall that was just cascading cascading down a river and it was just an incredible and it's one of those waterfalls where the sun is beaming and you see all the lights and the rainbows and everything and I'm, I'm praying this and I immediately turn to the person and all of a sudden there's tears just there's, oh, they're, the own I mean I think I prophesied waterfalls over eyes because then she just started to cry relentlessly and and I'm just like I'm so sorry what did I do <laughs> but but a week prior she had just she had just visited a waterfall and she was reflecting on what God was doing in her life and it was, just, it, was, and it was just in that moment, that moment when you receive that prophetic word, the joy you feel in that moment is unmeasured. Thing is, we then return to the worldly stuff, and so that joy doesn't really stay manifested in that way because we then focus on, oh, um, I don't have any gas in my car. <clears throat> right? So we allow the world to disrupt that joy sometimes. But in all, you want to have limitless joy. I mean, re rejoice always. Just have joy anyway, right? That's kind of what Paul's saying here. You don't have joy? Eh, just have joy anyway. Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> don't despise prophecies. Don't quench the spirit. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God. If I could leave you with an encouraging fact about this point before we move on. Don't leave this church, don't leave this moment allowing yourself to be suffocated by what's unfinished. Focus on what God has already done in your life. And if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then if he's done something powerful in your life, it's just a matter of time before that next powerful moment comes. Keep your eyes focused on him. Praise God for the completion of his will. Number three, Instead of fueling my joy based on the opinions of people, fuel my joy through the mindset of God. Instead of fueling my joy based on the opinions of people, fuel my joy through the mindset of God. Sometimes we just love to hear people give us assurance and affirm us. Sometimes we really hate when people tell us things we don't want to hear. Right? It always feels so good to me if like, somebody comes up. I've had, I've had a, a few people come up and it's like, oh, that's a, that was a great sermon. Right? I've had some people come up and be like, eh, yeah, it was okay. Right? And it's like, okay, you know, it's fine. 
but how are, we, how are we allowing what's happening in here, what's happening up here, how is it being fueled? Because I, I, I'll tell you that we are being fueled by something. Everybody's being fueled by something. What is it that's fueling you? So many people, and like I said, this is one of my problems in high school and college, and even today I struggle with it just a little bit, but I've, I've gotten a lot better. But it's just this thing where we fuel everything we do and everything we say and everything we choose on what people think. And we don't really care about the mindset of God. We allow people to call us a loser. We allow people to call us unqualified. We allow people to call us jerky jerk face. I don't know. But we believe it. We believe it. We receive it. We take it in. Oh, yeah, I must be a loser. I must be a loser. Oh, you're right. I, I could certainly not do this. I'm certainly not qualified for this. You're absolutely right. Oh, you're absolutely right. I, I do mess everything up. Oh, you're right. I don't love you enough. Oh, you're right. I don't spend enough time with you. And all of a sudden, our souls and our minds are just poisoned, and we feel like we're not good enough. And, and I say what's amusing about it, but honestly, what's tragic, I guess you can look at it one of two ways. It's either amusing, maybe you've lived through it, and so you look back and it's amusing, or you look at it now and it's tragic, but we base our identity off, off those people. We base everything we are, we base everything that we've become, we base everything that we think we can accomplish off those opinions instead of focusing on what our creator thinks. Which, which is like, it's, it's, it's flabbergasting, right? It's, it's mind-boggling, it's mind-bending. If God created us, why, why is he not the one we're turning to? If we're his masterpiece and workmanship, why aren't we turning to what he says about us? Why aren't we praying to, to, to hear and reveal what he says about us? Because I guarantee you that you ever have a thought that you're a loser, God didn't say that. If you ever hear a thought that you're a failure, God didn't say that. If you hear a thought process that says, I'll never amount to anything, God didn't say that. God doesn't say that. It's time to stop. It's time to turn that faucet, right? Everybody, everybody just needs to imagine. You allow, you allow a flow of negativity and hateful talk and gossip and drama. You allow that to flow into your pipeline. It's time to take that nice big wrench, take that nice big wheel and creak and close that off. Close it off and leave open the conduit of Jesus Christ and what God says about you. That's what you need to do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says this, In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, right? How many, how many have people in their lives that just love to count the trespasses? Well, remember when you did this? Remember when you did that? I'll never forget. I'll never forgive. Not counting the trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. God made the one who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says we're reconciled. The Bible says we're ambassadors. The Bible says God is making his appeal through us. For our sake, God made the one who knew no sin to be sin. Once again, we did not have to go to that cross. Jesus did it for us. So that in him, we might become not the failure of God, not that we might become the unqualified of God, not that we might become the nobodies of God. It says that we might become the righteousness of God. That's the master plan. That's your blueprint. That's who you are. All of these opinions of others, knock it off. And let's just be done. And let's focus on what God says. Amen? Let's focus on what God says. Final point is this, and I'm going to ask the worship team if you would come back up, please. Final point is this. Instead of living in comparison of people around me, be overjoyed by celebrating what God is doing in people around me. 
instead of living in comparison of people around me, be overjoyed by celebrating what God is doing in people around me. We play the comparative game a lot, I think. We make life out to be a competition, right? I mean, you, you see this in the family. You, if, you, if you've got kids and they're siblings, you see that like if one gets something, then it's all of a sudden it's like, well, wait, I didn't get that. Or his piece is bigger than mine. Or he got two slices and I got one. His birthday's sooner than mine. He got ice cream, I didn't. He gets a later bedtime, I don't, right? We, it, it, it's almost ingrained within us. It's ingrained within us that we should just compare ourselves to everything and everyone. And so we think, oh, I don't worship as well as that person. Oh, I don't sing as well as that person. Well, this church isn't as big as that church. Well, I'm not as good a preacher as that preacher. Well, th that preacher gets invited to all the conferences and I don't. I mean, we can, we can just keep on going, right? Oh, that student, I'm, I'm, they're getting good grades. I'm getting bad grades. That means I'm a terrible student. That teacher prefers them. They keep getting, they're, they're the starters and I'm always on the bench, right? It's always comparison. But what if we lived our life and what if, we, what if we built ourselves up and what if everything we did was simply for ourselves, was simply for us to become better? And what if every time we looked outside of ourselves and what if every time we saw that person getting better grades, what if every time we saw that person who was a better singer, what if we saw that church that was bigger, what if we saw all those things and instead of comparing ourselves, we said, praise God for what's happening. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As a matter of fact, I think this is not the scripture that I, I place, but I think of myself, you know, when Jesus came on the scene and John the Baptist, he, man, he's baptizing everybody and he's built this following. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, everybody's following this Jesus guy. And his followers come to him and say, hey, everybody's going to be baptized by Jesus. Our, our, our numbers, uh, you know, we, we, we did a projection for baptisms and uh, everybody's getting baptized over there by this Jesus guy. And John the Baptist says, praise God. I mean, he didn't say that literally, but he said, what he said was, I may become less so that he may become more. It's time to celebrate what's happening. Celebrate what's going on with people. Celebrate what's happening with people in your life. Celebrate. When you look at people that are growing in their faith, celebrate that. When you've got people that are better singers than you, celebrate that. When there are students getting better grades, celebrate that. Praise God, right? What is it? What would it look like? How would you transform the mindset of people? How would you make somebody's day? Maybe you come up to them and maybe they're expecting you to say something or slander because you know what? They're just not in the same realm as you, but you say, you know what? Praise God for what he's doing in your life. That's amazing. That's amazing. See how the atmosphere shifts and change, where everything we do toward others is giving God praise for what they're accomplishing and not saying, well, they have that, but I don't. There's no joy there, but there is joy in celebrating everything God is doing through the people around us. So let's do that. Find somebody. Can you do that? Can I just give you some homework? I know it's not school. I'm not going to grade you, but can you find somebody today? Find somebody in your community or find somebody in the church or find somebody in another church and just, and just tell them, listen, hey, I am really proud of what God is doing in your life. And I'm praising God for what he's doing. And if, you, if there's somebody, and here's, here's the key, if there's somebody in your life that you often compare yourself to, tell it to them specifically. And cut that comparison. And instead just give God praise for what he's doing. Because God's going to do something in you. See, we're all unique. We're all unique. There's no other person like me. And my wife says, praise God for that. There's no other person like you. You're created uniquely, individually. There's no other church like this. There's no other community like Cherry Tree. There's no, there, everything is designed with a plan and a purpose. And that plan doesn't always look the same. It often looks different. So let's focus instead on the one who provides, on the one whose name is greater. Galatians chapter 5, here's the ending scripture for this morning. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love become enslaved to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
You want limitless joy? That's how it happens. Be overjoyed by celebrating what God is doing in the people around you. Fuel your joy through God's mindset, not through people. Don't worry about what's unfinished, but be joyed, overjoyed that God has completed his will in your life. And focus your everything on Jesus, and you'll see that your joy will become limitless. Let's pray. Let's close our eyes. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and we praise you. We give you all glory, Lord. And so right now we just pray anybody who needs a touch from you today, Jesus, anybody who needs a touch from heaven, anybody who needs to take that next step, Lord, we pray over them now. We pray that they would open their heart to you. We pray that they would open their mind to you. We pray that they would just, they would start to release, that they would start to just let go of everything that they've ever struggled with, anything that they've ever dealt with, Lord. We pray that you would help us. We pray that you would be with us in this time. We pray that you would be with us in this time. And Father, if anybody here needs to know who you are, Lord, we pray right now that they would open their heart, open the door, declare you as their Lord and Savior. I pray for our people that need to take that step of water baptism next week. But Lord, I pray in a world where things are going right and going wrong within a millisecond, Father, let our joy be complete in you. Let our joy be fueled by the power of your Spirit. And we give you thanks and praise. And we pray in the name of Jesus, all who need you today, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. As we go from this place today, we pray that, God, we would just declare how beautiful and wonderful and powerful your name is. And so may we go from this place, but may we first worship you. And may we first give everything that we are to you in worship and praise. Let us open our hearts to you today and experience you in a more powerful way than ever before. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's sing. Let's stand and sing right now. Let's sing and declare how wonderful, how beautiful, and how powerful that name is. Thank you, Father.
are holy, Lord. You are holy, Lord. Jesus, praise you. Hallelujah. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Let that name be the only name on your mind when you think of the joy that you have. Let it be the joy in the Lord. Let it be the joy in the name of Jesus Christ, the beautiful, wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. Lift your hands. Let me pray over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I praise you, and we lift up all to you today. We thank you, Lord, that our joy can be complete in you, that even when joy fails us in this world, that the joy of you, Lord, that can be our strength. So I pray that over everyone that is here today. I pray that they would leave this place and be sent from this place with incredible, abounding, limitless joy. And we thank you, Father. We thank you that you bless us. We thank you that you cause your face to shine upon us. Lord, we pray that you would lift your countenance to us in this time and that you would grant us your peace and your joy in the mighty and powerful, wonderful, beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing our way out of this place today, church. God bless you and have a wonderful day. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. Oh